Gothic Metal and the Enigma of Fields of the Nephilim, Chapter 1, Before Gothic Rock. So, while it's absurdly common to see people on the internet, many of whom would be y younger than myself, make such claims as, and I quote, Gothic Rock is an offshoot of the post-punk scene. Or some variation thereof. Post-punk wasn't really a term in widespread usage until about 2010. And, I mean, yeah, I'm sure somebody is going to, you know, point me to Wikipedia and say, well, look, it was actually coined in 1777 by And, you know, that's, that's great, that's great, but I'm telling you, I was, I was alive and well and functioning. Um, and a very much part of the gothic uh, subculture in the 90s. And post-punk was not, was not a term in widespread use uh, amongst goths or anybody, to be quite honest. Um, it was a bit of an oddity until very recently. And, you know, the closest thing um, that, you know, was used in the 80s was New Wave. If it wasn't punk, or, you know, but it was, but it was quirky and new and weird and adults didn't like it, it was New Wave. Definitely, especially if it was a band that formed after punk. Uh, but again, this New Wave had a lot of the same issues you know, that you know, post-punk has even now in that it was more defined by what it was not, which it was neither mainstream nor was it punk. And that's kind of all post-punk means, is that um, it wasn't exactly mainstream at the time, but it definitely wasn't punk somehow. Um, uh, in the UK, there was the term posi-punk, or positive punk, as in positively punk, not as in peace punk, which is a different thing that sprouted up somewhere else. Um, but positively punk, as in true punk, as in more punk than punk. And this was, uh, um, but this was also a term that wasn't really easy to define as far as what a band sounded like, because it was applied to, um, mostly I see it referring to Rubella Ballet, uh, Southern Death Cult, and occasionally Sex Gang Children, if only because all three of those bands were anarchist bands. They were offshoots of the anarcho-punk community, um, you know, Andy Sex Gang himself has detailed his times living in squats, and Rubella Ballet, like, their literal mother. So, Gemstone, and... Brain farting on the boy's name, but their literal mother, their literal mother, vice versa, uh, was an anarchist and a punk, and she was, uh, she was member of Poison Girls, and... She was a punk until, um, until she died, and she was one of the many losses of 2016. Um, at the same time, she was also 80, so she had a pretty good run for, you know, for somebody, you know. And, you know, that, that does mean, yeah, do the math, she did not form Poison Girls until she was about 40, so, uh, did, she's... Uh, that alone, you know, keeps keeps her very dear to my heart, so. Because I, too, am old. The most consistent, uh, descriptive usage of post-punk seems to be any band formed after the mainstream punk explosion of about 1977 um, until about 1985... Uh, which, again, wasn't exactly mainstream, but it also wasn't really punk. Uh, 
Yeah. Such as Echo and the Bunny Men, or the Bolshoi. To some extent, the Cure, because they're not exactly gothic rock, but they sure as hell aren't punk. And, you know, while they do have considerable mainstream appeal, um, they're, they're definitely not quite as big as a lot of other bands out there. Um, this is also used to refer to any newer bands that have definitely formed, especially in the last ten years, um, that certainly mimic a lot of sounds of the post-punk era. So, you know, we've got bands like Peeling Gray from mm, the Los Angeles area, though I do believe most members are based in, um, in Long Beach. Um, and... I'm brain farting. <laughs> on others. Now, in the 90s, the term of choice for the post-grunge era of, you know, similar enough, like, you know, because grunge was the, you know, mainstreaming of punk um, in the early 90s. I want to say about 92, um, Nirvana was big on the public consciousness as far as the media goes. And that was, you know, the, the mainstream of punk, you know, after punk, was the mainstream of grunge. And so, you know, when you had bands that were definitely not, you know, punk or grunge, but also not exactly mainstream, the term was alternative or indie. And There didn't seem to be a huge distinction between how those terms were used, though, um, in general, um, you had a lot of bands, um, that, you know, certain writers would say, you know, are indie because they were a bit more kind of folksy sounding, I suppose, um, whereas alternative was closer to hard rock, I suppose, um. You know, just to drive the point home of how loosey-goosey, um, you know, these ter terms all, all were, especially New Wave in the 80s, because that was the term of choice in the 80s, in, in the, especially in the States, is like, you could easily open up, um, you could easily open up a music magazine, um, Rolling Stone, for instance, uh, there were a bunch of others, but that's, that's the main one that is definitely still around. Like, you could open up Rolling Stone, and, you know, um, they would, you know, refer to the B-52s as New Wave, but Blondie were punk, and then in the, and then, like, a year or two later, like, both bands would put out different albums, and, you know, a different reviewer would say that Blondie was New Wave, but the B-52s were punk. Uh, so that, that's about how much sense, you know, any of these words mean. That is how conclusive any of these terms could be used as genre, you know, in the 90s, you know. The B-52s, you know, they, they were neither New Wave or anything, like, you know, uh, like Love Shack, that was a big thing, and like, that was their big song in 1991. That was, like, literally their biggest song ever. That was 1991, and that was, um... For a brief, you know, some some reviewers still stuck with New Wave. A lot of them, trying to appeal to younger kids, would call the B-52s alternative or indie. And again, this is this is how it works. This is how it works. These are terms that ultimately don't mean anything. Like nobody can say what this sound definitely is, and what that sound definitely is. Um, since the 80s, we've had attempts, mainly by Ishker's Guide to Electronic Music, I will put a link in the description, of trying to retroactively define a new wave as its own brand of synth pop, but again, that doesn't work when you go and look at the historical usage of new wave, um, because there are still a lot of people hanging around um, many older than me who know that, you know, no, no, well, I mean, yeah, Gary Newman is a kind of new wave, you know, and Ishker is, you know, defining Tubeway Army as, you know, new wave because it's, you know, a specific kind of, you know, weirdo synth pop, but, no, well, but also, 
the Cindy Lauper is new wave, and Echo and the Bunny Men is new wave, and B fifty twos are new wave. It's like so, yeah. Like when when you get, you know, maybe in another twenty, thirty, forty years, new wave as far as music goes might mean something concrete. But as of now, it really doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't say anything conclusive about what something sounds like. It definitely, you know, definitely when you consider terms like new wave and post punk, which really don't mean any, which really don't mean anything as far as describing what a band album or song sounds like. It ultimately means nothing. These are the indefinables. From the latest of the 1970s through about 1984, and I'm only saying 84 just to just give a ballpark, you know. It's for the sake of simplicity. It is so I say far fewer syllables than I need to. So let's say 78 through about 84. That's about, what, six years? Sure. Um, there were actually several scenes that would later congeal, because you got to use blood-based terminologies, because we are all ooky spooky goths, aren't we? So there were several scenes between about 78 through about 84 um, that would all congeal into the gothic subculture, which really didn't start to come onto its own until later in the decade, but I will get to that. In the UK, most prominently, we had London's Batcave Club, and therefore Batcave Scene. Now, I do have some some talking at some point in the future about what makes what makes it a scene, what makes it a subculture. But the simplest way I can put it right now is a scene is not a subculture. A scene is a local network of musicians, clubs club goers and other artists a scene is local a subculture goes beyond the local does that make sense london's bat cave was actually fairly eclectic as far as the singles they would play in the dj booth and the bands they would host um and some of it, I'm sure, would make these goth v industrial music separatists just shit their pants. <laughs> because, as far as club scenes goes, goth and industrial music have been bedfellows for quite some time. And it all goes back to the Batcave, if you want to be perfectly honest. The Batcave didn't simply host, you know, the earlier bands, the anarcho-punk bands I was speaking of earlier, you know, so we had, so not only did, like, Rubello Ballet, uh, Southern Death Cult, Sex Gang Children play, or at least knew a lot of people who were involved, play at, or at, were at least somehow connected to people involved with the Batcave uh, scene, but the Batcave also hosted, like, you know, and played music by Bauhaus, early Jean Loves Jezebel, um, Bolshoi, like I said, um, Echo and the Bunny Men, like I said, uh, Classics Nouveau, uh, though I've seen a lot of people who consider them, they were more of a new romantic kind of band, uh, whereas, you know, the early goths, you know, considered them more underground, considered themselves more underground, while, you know, new romantic was a bit more, was considered a bit more mainstream friendly. Um, but, you know, Batcave also hosted and played the music of Fad Gadget, just about anything Genesis Peorage was involved in, uh, Germany's Malaria, because uh, you gotta have the exclamation point, um, Front 242 from Belgium, and Canada's own Skinny Puppy, which I believe are from Vancouver. These were all played in addition to the early goth bands, which... Uh, and they also played a lot of music which would be considered avant-garde, so, you know, we've also got, I mean, I guess you could technically say Fad Gadget was only influential in industrial music. He didn't actually play that. He played whatever the hell was he was doing, you know, but we also had, you know, Daniel Dax and Lemon Kittens and also Carl Blake and David Knight. And we also hosted 
And Batcave also hosted, well, I mean, their house band, because Ollie Wisdom ran Batcave, uh, was the glam band Specimen, and you can't convince me that Specimen is not a glam band. Listen to Specimen, listen to Sweet. Please tell me, like, how Specimen is so wildly different from, you know, <laughs> from 70s glam. Please, try and explain it to me in the comments, because, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I see how they've influenced goths. I see why goths love Specimen. At the same time, their music is not gothic rock. And I will get to that. And, of course, one of the more famous associates of the Batcave you know, scene is what I like to call the synth-based what-the-fuck punk band Alien Sex Fiend. Yes, they are their own genre. Do not convince me otherwise. Now in Los Angeles, so, you know, other side of the world, but the same hemisphere, northern hemisphere being, we had the death rock scene. Again, I specify scene. This is not exactly a, a genre, and you will find out why, because a lot of the bands that held the death rocks that were considered core to the LA death rock scene were, first off, uh, they were originally formed as either a side project or after, you know, project of hardcore punk bands. So we had Don Bowles from The Germs. Don Bowles uh, formed Vox Pop at the same time he was in The Germs, like before he left The Germs. Um, and then briefly rejoin the germs. But that's another story for another time. Uh, and Vox Pop, the same members of Vox Pop were in 45 Grave, uh, but playing different instruments. So Don sang in Vox Pop, drummed for 45 Grave. Um, and uh, The Adolescents, featuring Rick Agnew, again, we've got an L.A. hardcore band. Um, his side project at the time... Um, was the first lineup of Christian Death. And, you know, in addition to, you know, all of this, we also had just about anything involved with Ross Williams is somehow considered a death rock by default. Even if it sounds nothing. Like, uh, I remember in the late 90s, early noughts on the even the DeathRock.com message boards. Somehow, Catastrophe Ballet was just as much Death Rock as only Theater of Pain. And you listen to these two records, and it's clear that these are not the same genre. So again, you know, we've got Death Rock. I mean, in recent years, it has kind of become a term to refer to a genre, but at the same time, that does not take away the fact that it was originally a local scene, particular to Los Angeles and surrounding area. Other staples of the death rock scene um, were included Super Heroines featuring Eva O, um, the original lineup of Social Distortion, you know, before Mike Ness went to prison and came out with an intense love for Johnny Cash and, you know, got all new members created a whole new sound, and it, it's basically not, it's basically a completely different band, just using the so social distortion name. Um, but uh, what is considered the, um, now th there's a compilation record I want you to go check out, it is called Hell Comes to Your House. This is basically the Death Rock Bible. These are the, these are the core bands that were considered integral to the death rock scene at the time. And as I said, you will hear that a lot of these bands have very different sounds, and many of them don't even sound like what is considered death rock as a genre these days, because death rock as a genre is a little bit more in line with... sounds like you listen to a lot of Roz Williams, especially, like, Only Theater of Pain and some Shadow Project. I mean, that's... That's kind of what death rock has become. I hate to admit it, but, you know, like, if if it's death rock as a genre, it's it's because y y y you listen to a lot of Roz Williams. It's just 
kind of how it is, you know? Uh, but yeah, check out Hell Comes to Your House. Again, this is, this is, these are considered the core bands of LA's death rock scene. Then in New York, in New York, uh, we had the No Wave scene, which that Bible is No New York. And this is one of the few scenes that, is one of the few cases where uh, No Wave uh, consciously named itself. Whereas I think Death Rock was just something that um, somebody referred to a couple of bands as sounding like, and the name just kind of caught on and stuck. Um, whereas No Wave was consciously chosen um, for the, for that scene, and it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek sort of thing. And No Wave, um, they took a far more art house, um, you know, art school kind of approach to punk music. Uh, so we had Lydia Lunch, we had the Del Byzantines featuring Jim Jarmusch before he decided he'd rather direct film. Um, kinda, yes, but not quite in the same way associated was uh, Richard Hell and the Voidoids. Um, we also had, ah, uh, who else did I list here? Um, uh, uh, Lise Marcel de la Croix. Uh, she was a French-born musician who, um, her music was kind of a satire of disco in the same way PDQ Bach satirizes classical music. So I love her. And depending on who you ask, also associated with No Wave would be, would include Klaus Nomi. So, you know, you see, we've got this very, uh, we've also had James Chance, uh, doing just, he was just doing improvisational jazz, um, in a punk idiom. Like, that's what you could call his music. You know, Lydia Lunch, uh, with and after Teenage Jesus and the Jerks. Um, so again, you know, we have these very eclectic sounds, but they are all kind of connected through this thread of, you know, sort of, you know, they, they're taking this very educated sort of look to it. And a lot of these musicians have since been embraced by goths on both sides of the Atlantic. And they've definitely been embraced by another scene that I will mention in a bit. Um, also in the New York area, though arguably more kind of in New Jersey, because there are a couple bands who are definitely based out of New Jersey, we had horror punk. And the most prominent horror punk bands, in approximate order of prominence, uh, would include um, Sam Sawan and the Misfits, and I know Glenn Danzig pronounces it Sam Hain, but, you know, Glenn Danzig's a fucking, you know, can suck my nut, right? Uh, you know, we had the Misfits, we had the Plasmatics and the Cramps, uh, which were two different bands, but I find a lot more, um, stuff with Wendy O. Williams getting on, you know, more mainstream-ish late-night stuff, um, in the YouTube archives than I do from the Cramps. The Cramps, you know, were one of those bands that kind of boiled under the surface and got more prominent as they aged. Uh, so more people know about the Cramps these days than the Plasmatics, uh, at least, you know, in more mainstream-ish, but not quite, circles. Um, we also had uh, The Undead and Rosemary's Babies. And I know Rosemary's Babies were definitely based out of Orange, New Jersey. Um, and, you know, so we had a lot of sounds coming from horror punk that were a lot more in line with what 45 Grave sound like, or I guess 45 Grave would be a lot more in line with what horror punk sounded like from out in New York. But, again, yeah, the, yeah, this was the 80s, so there's that whole L.A. v. New York thing. Um, so, you know, I've seen a lot of people retroactively refer to 45 Grave as horror punk, and they're not exactly wrong in saying that. Um, but you ask Dinah Cancer, it, it, she's a fucking death rocker, she always will be, horror punk's New York shit. <laughs> And on the other side of the world, we had... So, you know, we're now going to the other side of the world, as in the Southern Hemisphere. We had the Swampies, as in Swamp Rock, which Wikipedia will tell you Swamp Rock is based out of, like, Alabama and Mississippi and New Orleans, and it's this kind of... Uh, 
um, offshoot, you know, there's kind of its own little sub-genre of uh, late 50s rock and roll. And that's not exactly wrong, but it's also a different creature from Australian Swamp. Australian Swamp Rock is named... We're not sure how it's named, or at least I've been unable to say exactly where the name came from. But I... Uh, the leading theory is that it is after the song Swampland by the scientists um, featuring Kim Salmon. He's done a lot of other things. He's done a lot of other things, but most prominently is the, is, um, is the scientists. Loosely associated with the Swampies, though, they're more considered a punk band, um, would be the Saints. I just saw a little, um, documentary on the, t um, there's this documentary series on the, t on the greatest Australian records, uh, even though most of them were recorded by, uh, during periods when the band was living in Europe. Uh, but yeah, I saw something about, uh, about the Saints, um, and I can definitely see how the Saints influenced the Swampies that, you know, came very shortly after. So, we had the scientists from Perth. Uh, we also had, um, and on the other side of Australia, uh, another potential source for the Swampy moniker, um, would be, uh, would be the birthday party, and, you know, Nick Cave's fascination with the American South and their blues traditions, though most people tend to side with the Scientist's uh, song as being the originator of the name for the swampy scene. Yeah, so, um, and, uh, and... Also featuring, um, also in the birthday party was Roland S. Howard. In fact, it's easily argued that the birthday party, which was mostly members of the Boys Next Door, um, but um, the Boys Next Door were kind of a power pop cover band before Roland S. Howard. And Nick Cave likes to downplay it now, but you hear a huge difference between the early Boys Next Door demos, which was pretty much all 60s covers. And you can easily find one of these on YouTube um, for uh, 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 These Boots Are Made For Walkin'. Um, but then Roland S. Howard joined the band, and you have the album Door Door, which is just so weird. So, you know, I know Cave and Howard were not speaking at the time Howard died, but... Um, but you cannot unconvince me that Roland S. Howard was the real, you know, creative force behind what turned the boys next door into the birthday party. So, uh, other bands included, um, uh, the Triffids from Perth, also from Perth, much like, uh, the scientists. Um, also from Perth, we had the Laughing Clowns featuring Ed Kipper, who was... Um, an early member of the Saints, not from Perth, would include Crime in the City Solution, who um, Roland S. Howard was briefly a member of after, um, after the birthday party disbanded. Swampies were also really into um, Wall of Voodoo. Um, this, also goes this also goes practically double for, um, er uh, for Australian goths after you know, that subculture migrated um, down to Oz later in the 80s. Australian goths love Wall of Voodoo. It is unreal to me. Because <laughs> I also love Wall of Voodoo, and Wall of Voodoo in the States, it's one of those bands, like, you know, they weren't exactly a part of L.A.'s punk or even death rock scene, um... You know, they, they are kind of regarded as new wave, if only, you know, in only that kind of, like, way that people use, you know, post-punk, you know, as kind of generally, as in, like, you know, they're not punk, but they're too weird to be mainstream. I mean, yeah, Mexican radio was kind of a, was, was kind of a one-hit wonder for them, but, you know, you listen to that in relation to the rest of their music, it's one of their weaker songs, and 
you know, I goddamn love Wall of Voodoo. And because of associations with uh, Nick Cave and Roland S. Howard, Swampies also really, Swampies and Australian Goths also really fucking love Lydia Lunch. And the few people who were still hanging on to the Swampy moniker into the 90s also really loved uh, PJ Harvey. And, you know, uh, even before she, you know, started working with Nick Cave. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, again, we've got this, this sound, and you listen to the music of these bands, and some of it is very clearly, you know, got this uh, 60s garage kind of influence to it. This is really, really clear with, uh, with the scientists and with uh, Crime in the City Solution, um, where, and definitely with the Triffids. Uh, but they're also doing their own thing with it, and you can definitely see how this would influence later Australian golf bands as well. Elsewhere in the world, uh, mostly continental Europe, we had, um, in France, and I'm told that the term was also used in Russia and Belgium, the scene was called Cold Wave, um, and... You know, the Cold Wave bands were um, um, were largely synth-pop based, and again, it was a thing that later became absorbed into the goth subculture. You know, there were, you know, certainly plenty of eclectic sounds within these local scenes that would later become absorbed by the larger goth subculture. Um, and in Germany, uh, the sound, which again seems fairly loosely applied, was uh, Neue Deutschwelle, um, or German New Music, or New German Music to be more um, exact. New German Sounds, I think. And Belgium gave us EBM with both Front 4242 as the harsher side of EBM, and uh, Poisson Noir for the more synth-pop based sounds of EBM that would later just evolve into its own kind of thing, and um, Ronan Harris in VNV Nation calls it future pop, and I'm like, no, nah, it just sounds like you listen to a lot of Belgian music. Amongst the uh, uh, Noy de Chevelle, and we had uh, uh, not only um, Malaria, but I don't say Noy Button. And I've probably mangled that. Deutsche um, Merkens uh, Franschip, De Krups, which literally means the Krups. Exmal Deutschland, Liaisons des Rus, Mania D, and as with several other bands that I've named, depending on who you ask, Propaganda featuring Claudia Bruchen who is one of my favorite singers. Oh, gosh, I love her. So many, so many of my favorite Germans are Bavarian. We've got Klaus Nomi, who's originally Bavarian. Uh, Claudia Brücken, who is Bavar who's originally Bavarian, though I think she spent most of her career in London. Um, even Dr. Ruth, who's originally Bavarian. I think the only one I... I think the only German I really love who's not originally Bavarian is Nico, who's from Cologne. But that's another story for another time. And... You know, then there were a couple other UK scenes that, you know, um, were cut. A lot of their early music was kind of adopted by goths later in the 80s. We had Shoegaze, which kind of had its origins in Manchester. And, you know, pre Madchester era, which was like the early 90s. Uh, I believe, with, like, Stone Roses, and Stone Roses is the one that really stands out to me. Um, but, you know, we had Joy Division, The Smiths, Cabaret Voltaire, and The Fall were all based out of Manchester. And the, um, Joy Division's one of those bands that I really couldn't get into until I got into The Fall, and I suddenly saw what Joy Division was doing. Only The Fall was doing it more. <laughs> it's like, it's like the difference between like like the fall. Just Marky e. Smith seems to go out of his way to avoid commercial appeal. 
whereas Joy Division definitely had far better commercial appeal. This, you know. Um, also in the UK, as I mentioned earlier, there were the New Romantics um, with a lot of bands including Adam and the Ants and uh, Visage and, as I mentioned, Classics Nouveau and New Romantics, at least to early goths, or, you know, the early scenes that would later become known as goth, the New Romantics were considered far more mainstream appeal, far prettier and all of that. New Romantic didn't really have any of their musicians associated with goth until much later. So basically, after you'd fallen out of the public eye, um, if you still wanted to stick around, there would probably be some goths who would now admit that they liked your music. <laughs> ah. Thus ends chapter one.